evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 6.11 uh, p.m. And I will call this governance meeting of the Burnsville City Council to order. And the city clerk will note uh, for the record that uh, Council Member Gustafson and Council Member Workman are absent. They are at the League of Minnesota Cities Conference up in Duluth. Uh, this meeting is being conducted both in person and online. Members of the public may attend in person if they so choose, or the public can also watch this meeting online at burnsvillemn.gov slash meetings or Comcast channel 16 or 859. <coughs> the public can also participate through Zoom by joining us at zoom.us slash join. More information is available on our meeting webpage and in a council agenda packet. Um, we have one item. Uh, that we are considering this evening, and this is the participatory budget expert testimony. City Manager Lindbergh, you have some remarks to make. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members of the Council, uh, it is our pleasure this evening to continue the governance process. Uh, just by way of a reminder, um, uh, as part of the Council's learning process around considering, uh, uh, in this case, the, the topic of participatory budgeting, uh, it is our pattern through our governance policy to invite experts uh, to provide you uh, with uh, additional information uh, that um, uh, kind of continues the conversation from the white paper that we presented to you just about a month ago. Uh, just by way of reminder for you, for the community, uh, that white paper is available both on our website and in uh, tonight's meeting packet. Um, we have two experts uh, who are planning uh, to chat with you this evening and to introduce them. Uh, I'll introduce Bethany Brewer, our Director of Strategic Initiatives. Uh, and as she comes up to make those introductions, um, just remind you that our next step uh, is public comment. That public comment is scheduled for August 8th. Um, staff's uh, already at work uh, engaging the community and letting them know about that step of the process uh, and the conversation that we've been having. Uh, and then the, this particular governance process will culminate with the council's discussion and direction, which is scheduled uh, for September 5th. So certainly we have a couple of experts for you tonight. Bethany will introduce you uh, to them. And if you have any questions for them, they certainly will be ready to take those questions for you. Mr. Brewer, welcome. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council. Good evening. I'm really um, excited to be here to introduce our experts tonight and very thankful for the experts that are joining us this evening. Um, our first uh, set of experts, our first panel, um, I'm excited to share come from the Participatory Budgeting Project. Um, so experts indeed, we have Elizabeth Cruz, who serves as the Director of Strategic Initiatives um, with the Participatory Budgeting Project, and then Cristania de Leon, who is the Co-Executive Director. And they're going to share uh, with you this evening, so I'm excited to welcome them and I'll turn it over to them now. Welcome. Thank you all so much for having us and thank you Bethany for that introduction. We're really grateful to be here um, and to explore a bit about how participatory budgeting happens in practice and how it could potentially take shape here in Burnsville. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Chrisanne DeLeon. I use she, her pronouns or any other pronoun offered with respect. It's absolutely fine with me. And as mentioned, I serve as one of our co-executive directors. Joined by my colleague Elizabeth. Elizabeth, do you want to share anything else about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Cruz. I use uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of strategic initiatives at PBT. So let's dive in. We mentioned we're from the Participatory Budgeting Project. Uh, if we get next slide, I um, just want to share a little bit more about who we are and, and what we do, why we're here. Um, at the Participatory Budgeting Project, or PBP, our our work is very simply to collaboratively transform democracy to center community power. Uh, we educate, advocate, implement for, build around, support this work at PVP across the U.S. and Canada. But I just want to emphasize that uh, this is not a practice that we have invented, that we have created, or you know, originated with us. Um, it is a practice that originated in Porto Alegre, Brazil, in the late 1980s, and has expanded globally from there. We are just one part of a growing global movement, um, which I'm sure you've seen in the white paper um, that was presented with all of the case studies and research so far. Um, and so I just want to clarify that, that this is the work that we do um, most commonly uh, across the U.S. and Canada. And uh, you see we have staff kind of positioned all over the U.S. Um, and, and still growing. Next slide, please. Want to just get us uh, grounded in a little bit about 
as we learn more about like what is participatory budgeting um, and some just general guidance or considerations for this practice, I um, want to just take some time to acknowledge how and why participatory budgeting is different than other kinds of budget participation that we might already engage in or already be considering. Um, this is a bit of an adaptation from the latter citizen engagement kind of first developed several decades ago by Shari Arnstein, who's a planner. Um, and we've kind of adapted to really talk a bit about different kinds of budget participation and really acknowledging that the role of our community members, the role of community voice will change depending on the strategies and approaches that we decide to use to inform our budget decision making. Um, and want to acknowledge, I think everybody present here is probably deeply and very familiar with things like hearings and deputations. Um, increasingly, we see folks use things like online games or simulations to really see how making adjustments in a budget can really affect uh, spending somewhere else or really getting a feel for how budgets can can shift and work or maybe being really clear about how our budgets are currently being allocated. Sometimes we do focus groups or town halls um, and increasingly I also see folks using um, budget surveys to ask folks, you know, what are the things that are priority to you? Um, and sometimes even local groups or local organizations will use these as well to say, you know, is there more community input we could be offering about our existing budgets? Um, and in each of these cases, you know, the role of community might be in listening in informing and learning and serving as a consultation um, to our elected decision makers or formal decision makers. Um, but what can happen on the community side is that the direct consequence of that feedback that they offer or what they might be learning to do in maybe an online game or simulation doesn't necessarily directly translate into decision making that reflects a broader community uh, sort of effort to really think about where investments maybe could or should be made to meet their existing needs. And there are opportunities for direct decision-making power. We know there are citizen boards and councils and other spaces. Um, and you know what we recognize is the challenge there is that there are fewer seats than community members who are impacted by these decisions, who have lived experience with expertise. And so when we think about participatory budgeting, we're thinking about a practice that's rooted in full participation. What does it look like for the full range of our community expertise, needs, voices, solutions to be surfaced and really heard that result in real money um, that's being invested to serve those community needs and to meet those priorities? Um, so it's one example of, of full participation in that process. Now I'll hand over to Elizabeth to talk a bit more about the sort of nuances and specific phases about what is PD in practice and how that full participation is borne out. Thanks, Chris. Next slide, please. So participatory budgeting, or PB, as I will call it from here on out, is a democratic process in which community members directly decide how to spend a part of a public budget. So it's real people making real decisions about real money. It's not a consultation um, like Chris talked about in the previous slide. Um, it's not a one day event, but it's an annual cycle of meetings and voting that gets that hopefully gets incorporated into the budget process. Next slide. So how does it work? So the government, uh, an agency or an organization will decide to do PD. They'll allocate a pot of money and then a steering committee will come together. That steering committee represents the community and what they do is they create the rules and engagement plan. So that could mean deciding how old you have to be to vote. In New York, you can vote as young as 12, I believe. Um, in other places that we've seen, uh, there's not a voting age at all. So if you can engage with the ballot, then you can vote. Um, also, it's a really great opportunity to engage uh, members of the community that aren't um, allowed to vote. So um, able to engage marginalized communities or undocumented communities um, in, in the PD process. So depending on what the steering committee decides about rules and engagement, um, they will then uh, take, go out into the community to brainstorm ideas. So that can happen through meetings, online tools, um, tabling at events, going to where people are and getting ideas from the community for how to spend that pot of money. Then a different group of folks called budget delegates will come together and they'll take all of the, those ideas, they'll work with city agencies, they'll work th with the community, decide what's feasible, uh, vet the proposals, and then turn those proposals into a ballot. And then that ballot goes back out to the community for voting. Um, and then those winning projects are funded. And we think it's also really important to evaluate the process. So uh, depending on what your um, goals were when you started really deciding if you meet those goals, what you, what you can do better, what you did really well, um, 
in particularly outreach. So if you decided that you really wanted to engage on documented communities or youth, how did you um, engage those folks? How, how did you make sure that their ideas were represented? How did you make sure that they knew about the vote and were able to vote? Um, next slide. So PB is happening all over the world and all over the country. You've seen since our first PB process, I believe in 2009 um, in Chicago, um, PB has spread across the country. So we've seen all different kinds of budgets, all different kinds of sizes of budgets. So Seattle's currently doing a $30 million process. Nashville's doing a $10 million process. Um, we've seen this happen all over the country. Uh, we've seen a lot of school budgets, so really using it as an opportunity to engage students in their schools and decision making um, in, in how money for their schools should be spent. So we've also seen in federal budgets in Rochester um, with the Empire State Poverty Reduction Initiative to address housing and poverty. We've also seen participatory budgeting across the country for ARPA funds, so the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, we have saw an equitable process in Grand Rapids, where they wanted to make sure that the folks most impacted by the pandemic were at the center of deciding how those funds should be spent. Um, next slide. I'll pass it back over to Chris to talk a little bit more about budgets. Sure. So Elizabeth mentioned there are all different kinds of budgets you can use uh, to allocate through participatory budgeting. Every budget's a little bit different, and so every PB process kind of grapples with are there certain kinds of restrictions or certain kinds of needs that come with selecting a certain pot of funds to do uh, participatory budgeting with. Um, but just to reiterate, we've seen folks use uh, local, state, or federal funds to run a PB process. We've seen folks use very small scale and sometimes even like internal resources. A nonprofit, for example, can run participatory budgeting with discretionary resources they may have within their uh, their internal budget. Our organization is one example of that, but there are many others. Another growing space of practice uh, in this work. Uh, we see folks use flexible discretionary funds as well as more prescriptive funds. As Elizabeth mentioned around ARPA or around even capital infrastructure investments, school budgets, et cetera. Um, one of the things we want to emphasize in thinking about what could work for you or what are things that you want to take into consideration for setting that budget um, are two kind of key things. One, is it money that matters to people? Is it an amount of money that's going to motivate folks to stay engaged for you know months and months to like lend their voice and be doing deep research proposal development? Um, is it an amount of money that folks feel will be consequential and that the investments will actually be impactful for them? And is it the kind of money that will lead to investment that people are motivated to engage in? Um, is it sort of maybe even if it is descriptive, is it flexible enough for folks to bring their visions, their hopes, their needs to the process um, so that it'll really fund things that people care about? The other kind of consideration is what amount of money you're allocating to actually implement the process. So how will you resource the logistics of community engagement and what's needed for it to be deeply equitable? So meeting accessibility needs, uh, communications needs, printing, translation, interpretation, participant stipends, how will you staff it? Um, so I want to acknowledge that there might be certain budgets that you allocate through participatory budgeting, and there might be additional budgets that you use that perhaps are more flexible and more discretionary um, to help you actually implement the process itself. Um, and those don't necessarily have to be the same type of budget. Next slide. We'll also just emphasize a couple of key considerations as we kind of wrap up uh, in kind of offering uh, the sort of groundwork here, and I'd we'll love to answer your questions as well. Um, but want to make sure, I think we'd be really remiss if we talked about participatory budgeting and was like, if you just do the cycle and you go through the phases, it will yield these amazing outcomes and impacts for community. And we'll say it looks different in every place because every community has different needs and is different. Um, but it is really critical to think about what are the key ways that you will bring certain values and certain goals to this process so that it really does work for you. And so we would really emphasize thinking a little bit about how will you make this process accessible um, so you can be set up for success and it's deeply equitable. So really ask asking, are we prepared to meet community where they are, where they tend to go? Are we okay and prepared to translate materials and offer interpretations on a regular basis through our meetings? Um, is it going to be made simple? Are we using the language and the approaches that are going to make sure that engagement is easy and it feels like this idea of participatory budgeting really translates well into community space, community ownership, and, key, and real collaboration? 
we think about is it inclusive and equitable and also kind of complementary to that, is it really going to center the lived experience and community-led decision-making we would like it to? Um, so how can we assure the process is really engaging those who are most impacted by challenges you may face in your communities? And how can their expertise inform the design phase um, some of our outreach approaches, things like that. Um, and are we able to really ensure that the community vote is honored? What they really vote for is implemented. Will it be significant for them? We also think a little bit about field research. Is there data information you want to pull around your local community to help identify needs and inform maybe needs assessments? And what kinds of research skills or approaches you want to use to really do that proposal development deeply, you know, effectively and really intentionally as well? Um, and finally, how are we going to learn by doing? What are we prepared to be able to let folks really do and have a hands-on role in, knowing that this is real collaboration? It's not intended to be um, sort of a, a theoretical practice. It's a real practice of real collaboration, real real stakes, real money. Um, so how do we actually really learn by doing and have some additional outcomes come through that that benefit our community long term? We thought about throwing in a couple of case studies, um, and I think we're going to skip those for time and also recognizing you have uh, a really robust and really useful white paper. Um, so to kind of wrap this up, I'm going to maybe encourage us if we could uh, go two slides forward. I just want to emphasize that, um, and, and one more if you can, thank you. We have resources on our website that we can also make available to you to complement um, you know, learning and discussion that you'll continue to have around participatory budgeting. One thing I'll lift up is this next generation democracy video, which really does feature other electeds really thinking about their experiences with PV, the challenges, opportunities, and the benefits, why they started, why they keep doing it, which could maybe resonate with the space. And then on the next slide, um, we'll also lift up a resource that we can share links to. Um, but this one also uh, offers some more case studies and ideas for funding participatory budgeting. Should you have a very particular topical interest in your city, you know, I want to really have some affordable housing outcomes, or I'm really looking for something around transportation. Um, this could be a really great resource um, to really think about how something like participatory budgeting really can help advance certain goals or objectives you might have or really think about what kinds of funding you could use to meet those needs. Uh, and with that, I will kind of wrap us up and, and maybe open the floor for Q&A if we're ready for that. Thank you so much, um, Ms. De Leon and uh, Ms. Crew for giving us your knowledge and your experience in this space. Ours is to listen and to understand. Thank you so much for sharing this, sharing this evening. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. All right. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council. If there are no more questions here, I'm going to um, introduce uh, Mark Ruff, who is the Finance Director with the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, we're excited that he could be here with us tonight before heading up to the uh, uh, co conference tomorrow morning. So thanks, Mark. Welcome. It's good to see you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, my name is Mark Ruff. It's a pleasure to be back in the Council Chambers here in Burnsville uh, for a number of years I served as a consultant for the city when I worked with Eller as a consulting firm, and then I spent yeah. six and a half years working at the city of Minneapolis, the majority of which was the, was the chief financial officer, and now I'm at the League of Cities. So it, it's great to see all of you talking about what is a very interesting topic and that you do have experts. I wouldn't put myself in the category of an expert in participatory budgeting. What I can talk about is a little bit of generally budgeting and how it relates to community engagement. Um, but when I was at Minneapolis, it was um, uh, the participatory budgeting project that we did hire to create a handbook um, that was a deep exploration of this topic between staff and elected officials. Um, and your white paper captures some of the background on that particular effort. I, I, I found the experience to be eye-opening as a staff person, especially in Minneapolis, because the community is so diverse in Minneapolis is, and, and I would, I think I'll just share what I um, thought about during that process and you can decide whether you as elected officials, this resonates with you. Um, one of the difficulties in any time we embark on something new like this and um, to, really highlight what was already talked about is, what do you define as success as the end of the day out of this? And what, what are you trying to um, enhance for your city 
that using what is a, already a very complex process, a budgeting process for a local government in Minnesota, and, and what are you trying to do in terms of enhancing the community engagement? So what do I mean, what, what do I mean by that specifically? What do I mean is, how, what are the metrics that you would define as success? So I've, in the white paper, it describes in very well in terms of the rate of participation. So is, is having X percent of your resident population involved in participatory budgeting a metric you want to use and one that you want to have drive as an indication of success? It's not one that I'm recommending. It's just one that I would raise as something for your consideration that we thought about during this process in Minneapolis. The second would be, um, instead of looking at just metrics of how many people um, participate is who is participating. And you know, I think the question was raised earlier about trying to reach out to communities who normally don't engage with local government. We all know that cities like any other form of government and any other institution oftentimes attract the same voices over and over and over again. So you only hear from um, people who take the time to learn the topics. So. You know, certainly we have significant portions of, um, of our communities who just don't either have the time or the knowledge or the resources to be able to understand even what questions to answer, ask in a budgeting process. So is your goal really to reach out to communities that just aren't touched? Or in the case of particularly around youth funding, are you really trying to build the next generation of leaders for government generally and restore some of the public trust that has been lost over a long, longer period of time by the increased complexity and um, maybe just generally cynicism towards government that has existed, you know, not just in the last few years, but for a number of years. And so I would just ask and ask myself in terms of what, how do we define success and then that probably gives you a better sense then as to what is the re what are the resources that are necessary to achieve that success. And certainly if your goal is larger numbers of participation, it means then a fairly significant infrastructure of volunteers and paid staff people to actually generate the um, interaction that's necessary to you know, get to a 10 or a 20% if that is what your metric is of participation? Or is it really engaging communities who, as was described, may not always have English as their first language, that who may have busy work schedules, who are off hours, that um, have a mistrust of just even interacting with government given if they come from another country where that can lead to imprisonment or, or worse um, for having interaction and putting yourself in a risk kind of position with governments. I mean, really, that, that then actually, like, what do you define as success then gives you the indication as to what resources are necessary to put forth the interaction. And I think the third is, um, and. I think what was highlighted already is how do you then simplify the language so it is digestible, mm -hmm. right? That is probably the biggest thing that we have in, in all of our um, in all of our work in in today's world is the world is complex and we want to move at a speed that's such that we make progress, but that oftentimes means that we don't take the time to explain to those who are um, not familiar with the terminology. So, you know, I think those types of questions that um, are important for any local government embarking on a new program, but are particularly one where you are making um, rather what I would say audacious promises, which is you get to make decisions on money. And if you, if you haven't built a thoughtful and authentic process, but you just treat it with lip service, um, then that actually can lead to worse outcomes than not doing anything at all. And I think that's what we struggled with in Minneapolis, is how do we actually create an authentic um, process? And uh, I think the preliminary kind of numbers that we were reviewing in order to engage all community, because I think for us in Minneapolis, it wasn't sufficient just to be targeting one particular area of population. And because of the neighborhood organization infrastructure that already existed, who are part of the people who are regularly part of the process, who expect to be a part of the process. You know, it was um, uh, anticipated that it would be several city staff people in addition to obviously the dozens of volunteers that would be necessary in order to embark on something that would 
um, include all community. And that was the, the mountain that kind of kept at least some progress. You know, you, you received in the white paper, there was a description of a, of a small federal, a portion of a large federal grant, but it was a small amount, $100,000, that was done for youth specifically through the Youth Coordinating Board, which is, a, which is um, an entity which is actually um, supported by the county and the school district and the park district, as well as the city of Minneapolis. And they utilized the infrastructure of the Youth Coordinating Board to undertake that um, allocation of resources. It was an infrastructure that was targeted to um, funding that was for youth and decisions made by youth. And I was not personally involved with it. We had staff with much more expertise than me um, who worked with the city that um, made a very strong effort and included, I think the number was a thousand voices in your white paper that um, that met their, um, that met their uh, metrics for success in terms of the group that was working on uh, that federal grant. I, to my knowledge, at least your white paper indicated that that has not been repeated in, in Minneapolis. It's not to say that there aren't voices who would like to do that, it's just um, there are always competing needs within those, within those efforts. Um, I think the, getting back to this issue of an authentic engagement process, and I think you know, the phrase that we, was used previously in terms of centering lived experiences is one where um, I think the, there's always skepticism, I think, within the public that, oh, the decision's already been made, you're just going through the motions, right? So how do we overcome that kind of skepticism? And that's to really then find community leaders who are um, trusted and can bring um, to those community members who trust them who are not normally associated with maybe city government, and say that, yes, this is something that we are aware of that we um, would recommend that you participate in. And so that is another area where we found in similar, maybe not around participatory budgeting, but in terms of actual community engagement, that having those leaders um, um, helping you in the planning process is probably what's going to help add to an authentic process, one where people feel like it is a genuine um, uh, effort that is worth their time. I, the last thing I want to just say is about stepping back on, on thinking about budgets um, and how you frame that discussion even generally within community discussions. Um, had some discussion internally with the League of Cities about this recently is, is we always think of budgets as just purely numbers documents, right? But in reality, uh, I think, um, and certainly in Minneapolis, a budget is a values document front and center, right? You are deciding how to spend your resources. It's also a legal document. You as a city have to spend money for certain things. The state mandates that, right? It's also a risk document, right? Which is, we don't know what's gonna happen over this year or in the places that have biannual budgets over those next two years. So we have to set aside certain money for contingency. We have to set aside some flexibility. Um, we, uh, we don't know what the cost overruns might be to accomplish some um, capital project. And so I think even in the framing of some of these discussions to, to broaden the description of what are we talking about, it's not just $100,000 or a million dollars or $10 million. It's really how this community expresses its values through this, through this process. And I, I feel like that language resonated whenever I had those conversations with, with different communities. Um, and it was less important to talk about capital versus operating. And frankly, it was more important to talk about, all right, we allocated this money. What really happened with this money? And then how did we actually measure the, the success as terms of how the group um, introduced it? And, I would say in reviewing the documents and thinking through this, I noticed that um, one, of the, one of the larger cities in the United States had decided to make this an every other year experience because they didn't feel like generating the I ideas and then actually allocating the money and then seeing success. It, it wasn't possible within an annual time frame to have that happen on a regular basis. And so I, I would suggest that part of, if you are interested in this is, is the 
pilot program or the baby steps or even not to make over promise that it's going to be happening every year, that you can actually do this once even every two or three years if you feel like the staff time or the volunteer base is such and limited that um, an annual is just is just too unrealistic for you to take on. Um, the last thing I would say is um, when when um, when I read through the white paper and saw in terms of the what some of the red flags that came up in other communities that I would just say is that um, an authentic experience in the red flags that come out is if it is just viewed as an extension of a political process. Yeah. And we have to ask those honest questions because politics aren't bad, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, famous author once said that the absence of politics is, is uh, dictatorship, right? That politics are not a bad thing. Um, the, the issue though is, because politics in, is a bad thing when it's only potentially this happens where then one group still, whether um, it's the people who show up who, who make noise at an annual budget meeting or the people who run the program are viewed as the ones who still get to make the decisions. Even though they may not be elected officials, it's still a small group of people who hold power. And I think at the end of the day, um, that is the that is the real test of democracy is to demonstrate to people that it's not just a small group of people who hold all the power. So I I would be happy to answer any questions, but I know that's a very broad sweeping um, overview. I would just say that to me, it's it, these are one of these endeavors where you learn by by um, talking about it and then potentially doing it, but only doing it when you can do it well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ruff. And Ms. Ruff, I think when you talk about community engagement and participation in a process, because you were very instrumental in helping us with the heart of the city. And that was a community engagement effort with a lot of participation of a lot of people involved. And you were one of those folks who was involved in all of that. You were on the financial side to help us understand what that all means for us when we're looking at the heart of the city. So I thank you for your help during that time. But that was a community engagement where people participated in the process. And the outcome of all of that, if you're looking for success, is what is in Burnsville today. And you did the analysis, if I believe, what that 54-acre site was yielding for the city with regard to property tax and what it is today and what we now have in terms of the income from that 54-acre site. So I would say that that was a very successful endeavor. But it takes time and patience. And, um, and you're right. I mean, to your point, Mayor, the uh, successful programs or projects, when they're successful, no one asks how much they cost. Because the benefits are fairly apparent, yeah. right? So it's both, it's more on terms of that return on investment yeah. that can be both in property taxes, but I would submit, um, and you would all say, is that the real return on investment is why people want to live in Burnsville. Yeah, right? yes, thank you. Do you consider five people a small group with all the power? Uh, uh, well, that's a rather large philosophical question. <laughs> or tonight, um, three I would say people that, free. Uh, <laughs> I would say that uh, if I, I don't really want to get into political views other than to say that if, if you believe in elections as a yeah, fair and open elections. way to, um, to be uh, a, an extension of how democracy should be successful in the future and the integrity of elections, yeah. um, then, then five people is not a small group of people, right? If we believe that only five people are making decisions and are not accountable to anyone, then we have larger problems. Agreed. Yeah, but I was a, it was a loaded question. I no, I, I, I appreciate it, but it group. deserves an answer, I couldn't answer, help but though. think of us. Yeah. It We're deserves an large, answer. Right? Yeah. 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 But, we, but we are accountable to the people who vote us into office. Yeah. 
Sure, and I think it's a fair, I mean, I, I think oftentimes in Minneapolis it was viewed as the staff made all the decisions and it didn't, didn't tell anybody else. And <laughs> so that, you know, that the unelected, you know, I think that's always like in any large right. institution, right. there's always that question of like, <laughs> what kind of unel <laughs> unelected um, representatives do we have within government? I can, well, I can assure you that was not the case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, this is very good. And thank you for coming in and delaying your trip up to Duluth for the league's uh, conference and uh, helping us to understand and to get some insight from your experience in Minneapolis. And uh, Ms. DeLeon, thank you uh, to you and Ms. Crew for your help as well. We really appreciate it. And I had talked to um, um, Mayor Schaff about you all, because uh, she is the, the uh, former mayor of Oakland and had also worked Mayor Schaff. And so uh, she told me about all of you and the work that you were doing in Oakland, because that's where you're, you're, you're based out of, if I'm correct in understanding where you're based out of. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and your knowledge. Mr. Ruff, thank and Mayor, you. And I do want to just compliment you. I, I would say your white paper was exceptional and one of the best documents that I've seen. Uh, so, very well. uh, our city manager and uh, our department heads. Yeah, so. our department heads, all of them. Um, Ms. Brewer had a big part to do with the, all of that. And uh, But every one of our leadership team had a hand in it. And I think uh, city manager um, Lindbergh, I think you said there were 53 people who all had some. That is correct, 50, uh, 50 some across the organization. So thank I, ho you. I hope I hope that you're taking that document or a link to that document to share at the Duluth gathering of the we League will, of Minnesota We will cities. share it uh, in many ways, oh, council good. member. Yes, indeed. I think yeah. it, it's a great tool for yeah. anybody to have. But thank you, Mr. Ruff. Thank, you, Thank you so much, Ms. DeLeon and Ms. Screw, and have a good evening. Members of the council, there is nothing else to come before us this evening, and a motion to adjourn is in order. So, so moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay, and the motion carries. Good night, and thank you for being with us.